party. Um, if you guys are here, it's a party. Um, and, and I want to welcome Tara Gallen and uh, Simon Rosenberg, two of the smartest uh, people whom also I just happen to like the hell out of who are joining us tonight. Before we get started about talking about the debate, Tara, tell us, um, t tell us more about this incredible organization that you put together and, and what it's doing with the News Chronicle. Okay, she's back. Welcome back, Tara. <laughs> well, we can start yeah. by saying that my internet is wobbly in the unfortunate hotel room I'm in in New York, but um, I'm very delighted to be here. If I go out, I apologize. Um, uh, for folks who don't know me, I'm the founder and publisher of Career. We are a pro-democracy news network. We have local newsrooms in 11 states across the country, um, as well as a national outlet at Courier Newsroom on all your socials. Um, and we focus primarily on reaching people who are uh, passive news consumers, people who don't watch cable news or listen to talk radio or pay through paywalls and get them good factual but left-leaning pro-democracy news uh, and content. Uh, we started five years ago, so uh, just celebrated our fifth birthday this summer. I would say, you know, Corey is the sort of thing that you would sit around talking about, like somebody should do this. And Tara actually did it, which is pretty amazing. And it's, you know, you think about how it's growing and the impact that it's having. Um, so it, it, it's a hell of an achievement and a hell of a thing. Um, uh, and everybody, if you aren't a subscriber to uh, Simon's uh, Substack, Opium, you really have to immediately go and subscribe to it. I read it every day as the first thing. Um, so let, let's kick this off. Tell, tell me yeah. what you're expecting tonight. Though. What do you think this is what's going to happen here in a minute? Simon, uh, you want to kick this off? No, uh, listen, I, I'll say two things. One is, I think the most important thing for the vice president is just to be herself and to, you know, to be confident and strong as she's been <laughs> over these last few months. Her performance in the stomp and at the convention has just been exemplary. And, you know, she knows what she wants to do. She knows what she wants to say. And I, it's critical she doesn't overthink it, you know, and she just goes out and does her thing. And um, the second thing is, and Stuart, you and I talked about this earlier, I think that it's really important that <clears throat> she figure out also as part of this how to deal with Trump's madness and his delusions and his craziness in a way that is relatable and, you know, things like, you know, Donald, I, I didn't understand anything you just said. I'm sure nobody else did either. I mean, there's going to be these moments in the debate mm -hmm. where it's going to be very hard to follow what he's saying because, you know, things like they've been tweeting out all day today, for example, this Haitian animal thing in Ohio, which is all this made up craziness. And those kinds of things are going to come out tonight. And, I think it's I think it's going to be definitional for her in how she defines those moments of his lying, his delusions and help people understand just how crazy this really all is and what he's saying and how he how crazy he's become in the 2024 cycle. And so but I feel good. I mean, we had a really good day of polling. I think we should go into this thing feeling confident and strong. And I turn it to my dear friend, Tara. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's exactly right. I think if uh, Kamala can be herself and Trump can be himself, the contrast is clear enough. I think also, you know, there is um, there is outsized pressure on her. Um, she did not go through a primary this election. Um, uh, the you know the, the the mainstream legacy media has been really hard on her about not doing more interviews while she has been out there talking to voters every single day. I think she's really risen to the occasion of a very unexpected trajectory, and there's been an enormous amount of enthusiasm on her side. And um, there is not, uh, I don't believe, a, a question about how she would govern or how she would approach key issues and concerns of the American people uh, related to the economy, related to climate change, related to reproductive rights and freedom that she doesn't have the better answer or set of solutions on than Trump. And so as long as she is, uh, it, it, she trusts herself and she is herself and she also, uh, you know, plays the role that we don't expect the moderators to play and she fact checks Trump also and encounters him in her time, I think that 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 will serve her really well. Yeah. You know, um, 
How much do you think, there's been a lot of debate about this, that uh, for, for both of you, that she should engage Trump? You know, it's, it's, it's gone, speculation has gone from just almost ignoring, don't get drawn into it, don't, you know, don't get in the, the mud with, uh, wrestle with the pig, um, to you can't let him go and say these things. You have to engage him. Where, where do you guys stand on that? Simon? Where, where? I think she's got to be very careful about this. <clears throat> you know, in all the years, I did thousands of appearances on Fox News, and I basically always ignored the other person I was on with and just made my case. Because once you start letting, once you start responding to them, you lose control and, and yep. you start getting off your game. So I think she's got to do it. This is why what I was saying earlier is that she's got to be very careful about how she approaches his lies, his craziness. And she can't, because if she engages it, she's letting him dictate the terms of the debate. She's responding to him and not telling her story. She has to tell her story tonight. It is the single most important thing for her tonight is not to take him down and not to wound him and not to respond to him. She's got to stay and tell her story and, and, and fill in the details for people. And she has to then do those other things second, in my view, um, in order to be successful tonight. But I'm interested, Tara. I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. I was going to say, I think this might be the first time I disagree with you, Simon. <laughs> in a while. I, I don't disagree that she has to tell her story tonight. I don't disagree. There are still so many Americans who actually don't know enough about Kamala Harris, despite her incredible record and for almost four years as vice president. So that is important. But I really believe that the majority of Americans actually want a fighter and they want someone who is going to stand up to the bullies and stand up to the fascists and stand up to the wannabe dictators. And I don't think that anyone has ever seen Kamala Harris be stronger than when she is prosecuting a case or she is on uh, the, the stand at committees. And we know that she can prosecute this case against this convicted felon. Um, and I think that the American people are actually really hungry for that. You think about the contrast of the last debate and the last Last ticket that we had in this one is that we want a fighter. People want a fighter. And she is a very, very, very skilled, experienced and strategic fighter. And I'm excited to see that fire in her. I'm excited for her to not just entirely ignore Trump and actually hold him accountable and watch him squirm. Um, we also are in a very different state of this country and our politics than we were in 2016 when Trump was stalking Hillary Clinton on the debate stage that really creepy way that we all remember where, you know, he, he, I doubt very much that he will try anything of that nature, but sh she won't stand for it. And I really think that she has the support of an incredible grassroots base behind her right now, that it's, it's hard to see her actually falter when she stands up to him. And I think that's something people actually very much want to see. Yeah. You know, I always think, uh, look at these things as what is the safest way to go. And to me, the greater danger would be that she doesn't seem to sort of take him to prosecute him. Um, and it's something she does very comfortably. Um, but, you know, part of this is going to fall down to how the, the moderators fact yeah. check and whether or not they're going to engage on this. You know, will Trump be able to say, well, you know, Roe v. Wade was overwhelmingly unpopular. We'll be able to say, like you were saying earlier, something. You know, the economy's terrible now. It was so much better when I was president, and you know, forgetting the fact he was the last president since Hoover to leave office with fewer jobs than when he took office. Um, I, I think there's an element here of how do you inspire your own people, and and, and I think that's what, you know the, the feel that they have a voice. But that goes a lot of ways. I think to speak I to the larger values and issues. I also think we have to keep in mind, sure, there's the television audience, but that's actually much smaller than the Internet audience, who's really only going to watch clips and moments from this debate. Right. And she has to get some moments in. And you don't really get moments by playing it safe anymore. Right. You, you actually kind of have to um, you have to create a moment. You have to have an exchange that is 
worthy of virality and engagement. And those are the things that the majority of people, especially the ones who haven't made a decision to vote or not, not necessarily who to vote for, are going to see if they see anything from this debate. And I think that's equally important, if not more so important, than, than, than speaking to the television engaged audience that's watching the entire thing. So let me just say one quick thing, because I actually agree with Tara, and I don't think we're disagreeing. I think it's a question of the tempo of how, of who controls right. the, the story. It's not about, of, yes, she must, you know, engage him in all the things she's saying, but there's a whole thing about being on air, right, where you she cannot allow him to start dictating the terms and the playing field of the debate. She she can stay her. She's got to stay on offense. She's got to do all the things that Tara said, but there comes a point where what he's going to try to do is he's going to try to destroy the debate. He's going to try to make it unwatchable and ugly. That's interesting. And, you know, and because that's what happened in the last debate, right? And it's just what he does. He is like an ugly machine, right? He's a machine of ugliness every day. And he wants her, he wants to make her small and fighting and like, you know, getting into petty fights with him, right? He's going to poke at her. And that's why she just has to pick her spots, right? Like, it's just, you're right, Tara. She needs two or three of these moments that will drive the, you know, the drive the internet over the next few days. But it's also about the tempo of the 90 minutes. And it's just really critical, also in terms of this issue of strength and power, about who's really dictating the, the tempo. And she's got to be careful about that. And we'll see. Look, we're going to learn. It's a minute away. Right. We're going to learn and it's exciting. And I think she's going to kick his ass. Yeah. You know, I think the greatest challenge is for her to f not let this be framed as a normal debate. You know, right. this isn't Romney versus uh, uh, President Obama. You know, I think you can't sort of allow him to be seen as a normal candidate. Right. You know, we're going to have a discussion here about inflation and forget the fact that he tried to overthrow the government. You know, um, and that'll be very interesting to see how she she does that. Because um, we've seen so much hydraulic pressure in the media to normalize this, um, which is, is, I think, very human, but very disappointing and troubling. We got to go watch, right? Okay. <laughs> okay we'll, we'll see everybody soon. And stay here, and we will bring it up as soon as it goes live. And you can comment, uh, and we'll all comment during the debate. So it will sh roll, happening roll right up. Here. All right, here we go. Now, just 10 seconds away, and we will be back with our post-game show as soon as it's over. We are going to toss it right now to David Muir and Lindsay Day. Tonight, the high-stakes showdown here in Philadelphia between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump. Their first face-to-face -face meeting in this presidential election, their first face-to-face -face meeting ever. A historic race for president upended just weeks ago. President Biden withdrawing after his last debate. Donald Trump now up against a new opponent. The candidates separated by the smallest of margins, essentially tied in the polls nationally and in the key battlegrounds, including right here in Pennsylvania, all still very much in play. The ABC News presidential debate starts right now. This is an ABC News special. The most consequential moment of this campaign. Kamala Harris. Together, we will charge a Donald Trump. We will soon be a great nation again. Face to face, historic. The ABC News presidential debate. Here now, David Muir and Lindsey Davis. Good evening, I'm David Muir, and thank you for joining us for tonight's ABC News presidential debate. We want to welcome viewers watching on ABC and around the world tonight. Vice President Kamala Harris and President Donald Trump are just moments away from taking the stage in this unprecedented race for president. And I'm Lindsay Davis. Tonight's meeting could be the most consequential event of their campaigns, with Election Day now less than two months away. For Vice President Kamala Harris, this is her first debate since President Biden withdrew from the race on July 21st. Of course, that decision followed his debate against President Donald Trump in June. Since then, this race has taken on an entirely new dynamic. And that brings us to the rules of tonight's debate. 
debate, 90 minutes with two commercial breaks. No topics or questions have been shared with the campaigns. The candidates will have two minutes to answer questions, and this is the clock. That's what they'll be seeing, two minutes for rebuttals and one minute for follow-ups, clarifications, or responses. Their microphones will only be turned on when it's their turn to speak. No pre-written notes allowed. There is no audience here tonight in this hall at the National Constitution Center. This is an intimate setting for two candidates who have never met. President Trump won the coin toss. He chose to deliver the final closing statement of the evening. Vice President Harris selected the podium to the right. So let's now welcome the candidates to the stage. Vice President Kamala Harris and President Donald Trump. Kamala Harris. Good to see you. Have fun. Thank you. Welcome to you both. It's wonderful to have you. It's an honor to have you both here tonight. Good evening. We are looking forward to a spirited and thoughtful debate. So let's get started. I want to begin tonight with the issue that voters repeatedly say is their number one issue, and that is the economy and the cost of living in this country. Vice President Harris, you and President Trump were elected four years ago, and your opponent on the stage here tonight often asks his supporters, are you better off than you were four years ago? When it comes to the economy, do you believe Americans are better off than they were four years ago? So I was raised as a middle class kid. And I am actually the only person on this stage who has a plan that is about lifting up the middle class and working people of America. I believe in the ambition, the aspirations, the dreams of the American people. And that is why I imagine and have actually a plan to build what I call an opportunity economy. Because here's the thing. We know that we have a, a shortage of, of homes and housing. And the cost of housing is too expensive for far too many people. We know that young families need support to raise their children, and I intend on extending a tax cut for those families of $6,000, which is the largest child tax credit that we have given in a long time, so that those young families can afford to buy a crib, buy a car seat, buy clothes for their children. My passion, one of them, is small businesses. I was actually, my mother raised my sister and me, but there was a woman who helped raise us. We call her our second mother. She was a small business owner. I love our small businesses. My plan is a $50,000 tax deduction to start up small businesses, knowing they are part of the backbone of America's economy. My opponent, on the other hand, his plan is to do what he has done before which is to provide a tax cut for billionaires and big corporations, which will result in $5 trillion to America's deficit. My opponent has a plan that I call the Trump's sales tax, which would be a 20% tax on everyday goods that you rely on to get through the month. Economists have said that that Trump sales tax would actually result for middle-class families in about $4,000 more a year because of his policies and his ideas about what should be the backs of middle class people paying for tax cuts for billionaires. President Trump, I'll give you two minutes. First of all, I have no sales tax. That's an incorrect statement. She knows that. Uh, we're doing tariffs on other countries. Other countries are going to finally, after 75 years, pay us back for all that we've done for the world. And the tariff will be substantial in some cases. I took in billions and billions of dollars, as you know, from China. In fact, they never took the tariff off because it was so much money they can't. It would totally destroy everything that they've set out to do. They're taking in billions of dollars from China and other places. They've left the tariffs on. When I had it, I had tariffs, and yet I had no inflation. Uh, look, we've had a terrible economy because inflation has, which is really known as a country buster, it breaks up countries. We have inflation like very few people have ever seen before, probably the worst in our nation's history. We were at 21 percent, but that's being generous because many things are 50, 60, 70 and 80 percent higher than they were just a few years ago. This has been a disaster for people, for the middle class, but for every class. On top of that, we have millions of people pouring into our country from prisons and jails, from mental institutions and insane asylums, and they're coming in and they're taking jobs that are occupied right now by African-Americans and Hispanics, and also unions. Unions are going to be affected very soon. And you see what's happening. You see what's happening with towns throughout the United States. You look at Springfield, Ohio. You look at Aurora in Colorado. 
They are taking over the towns. They're taking over buildings. They're going in violently. These are the people that she and Biden led into our country, and they're destroying our country. They're dangerous. They're at the highest level.